We will now delve into this in our next panel. But before we start, the founder of Learning Studio, a European collective of freelancers focusing on the future of education and work, and also member of the DigiEdu uh, Hack Steering Group, will give you a short and crisp input on the potential of hackathons and also on collaboration online. This is uh, Margot Pelen. I pray to God that I promised uh, pronounce your, your name correctly. Margot, can you hear me, please? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much, Dmitry, for welcoming me. And that was a really nice pronunciation of the name. <laughs> yes, succeed. Okay, go on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, I mean, Hackathon in the term is already a connection of two uh, terms. You have hack and you have marathon. So it's this, you know, all together, let's come, let's align, and let's make sure that we kind of run with this common, you know, time, space, and intention towards something that's going to be very uh, tangible. Um, it's fairly new, I would say. I think the first hackathon was organized about 20 years ago, uh, and it's gaining speed today. Because as our uh, previous guest uh, Oliver was mentioning, uh, COVID made this year a little bit special, um, and it's obviously quite uh, challenging as you know we can't really unite in the same location. But it's also extremely exciting because it means that today you can collaborate with anyone in the world, just with an internet connection, a screen, and just a bit of alignment. But there's also wonderful tools, as I'm sure a lot of our participants are currently experimenting. Um, I mean, my background is also, so I'm, I'm the founder of Learning Studio, but I'm also um, the chief operating officer of a remote first startup uh, based in Berlin called CodeControl.io. Um, and we were always working fully remote. So now seeing this potential of Hackathon brought to the next level is also something that shows that we can also keep on pushing for more uh, engagement with whoever is interested by the same uh, you know, topic, but also with the same goal. And it, so it also showed that we can be very resilient in this uh, years. Because a little experience, like 10 years ago, I was helping organize startup weekends, which was, you know, 54 hours to go from an idea to a prototype. Uh, and now we can do this absolutely without any, any limitation. Mm -hmm. And also one interesting point for our topic today, uh, and as it was also discussed during this uh, pre-panel uh, conversation, um, this topic of the U.S. versus Europe, I think there is a number of services that are sometimes brought from the U.S. to Europe, but with these very local events, like, you know, because anyone in Europe can participate, we also have the capacity to digitalize and to accelerate those grassroots movements and those grassroots um, uh, services. And I think it's really something that matters and that makes it really stand out today. Yeah, interesting facts. Thank you very much, Margot Pelen. Uh, we will now clarify all open, maybe other questions, and Margot will join our panel too. And now I will introduce uh, the other pa uh, participants, no panelists, to you. Uh, one of them is Florian Rampelt. Uh, he's uh, physically present with me here on stage. He's organizer of another successful German hackathon we talked about uh, five minutes ago, Semester Hack. Thank you very much, and hello, Florian. Uh, He's also a steering group member from uh, Digi uh, EduHack. Mirko Schödel is with us. Mirko is one of the organizers of the extremely successful German hackathon Wir für Schule. Hello, Mirko. And Ulrike Haferstroh joins us also. Ulrike runs uh, the incredibly important diversity project Gemeinsam Einzigartig, so together unique. And we are glad to have Professor Thomas Gegenhuber from the University of Leuphana Lüneburg with us. Thomas currently studies a special uh, hackathon to understand how, yeah, how main actors can collaborate better. And of course, we talk uh, with Margot Pelen, uh, as I said before. So a uh, short notice to all of you, just uh, raise your hand whenever you have a comment, okay? Uh, hopefully you agree. So at the beginning of the pandemic, an education hackathon became Germany's most successful hackathon with over 6,000 participants. Hashtag Wir für Schule. Result, over 200 ideas about present and future education. Mirko, Mirko Schödel, he's one of the organizers. Mirko, did you expect such a success? Uh, thanks, Mitri. Thanks for the invitation as well. Um, Actually, we didn't, so we weren't sure what to expect, really. And I think we had 
500 participants like a week before and then we started to really um, get engaged and get people to participate so we had the pre-runner of uh, uh, via versus virus um, we have more than 40,000 participants and um, then actually we we started to think that education uh, is kind of in a shock and that schools don't know what to do and that we need to find solutions. Um, and as we saw more than 6,000 people from different parts of the country uh, wanted to participate and develop solutions, not only for the COVID situation, but also for uh, long-term challenges that we have. Yeah. And to give uh, our uh, viewers and uh, participants more insights, you brought some footage. Maybe you can say what we are going to see. Yeah, so um, we had, as you said, more than uh, 200 solutions that were handed in and many projects continued. Um, but we had 15 winner projects in several categories. And I brought you two of them. So. Um, First is the winner of, or one of the winners of the category, which is named Connecting Homeschooling Classroom Teaching. Um, the organization or the team is called Naclario, and they want to connect pupils with volunteer tutors on demand and for free. So something in Germany mostly that's called Nachhilfe, um, but it's more than that, and it's free, uh, which is exactly helping people from um, social, um, people with this social background that cannot actually uh, give money to, yeah. to uh, spend for tutoring. Um, so whenever people has a question, they can just go on the site and then um, ask the questions. And then there's a volunteer who actually gets engaged in a video chat and uh, they get a quick answer to the question. Okay, um, Mirko, I would say let's dive into it, okay? All right. Okay. <laughs> Let's start. One in two children in Germany receive extracurricular support during their time in school. This is dependent on the resources of the parents when it comes to time, knowledge and finances. This leads to children from the lower class receiving only half as much support as children from the upper class. At the same time, there are more than 30 million volunteers that want to help. They seek a medium through which they can help in a flexible and easy way without obligation. This is why we created Naclario. We built a bridge between pupils on the one side and tutors on the other side in order to have on demand at the push of a button target-oriented support. We are Naclario and we empower pupils with free on-demand tutoring. And what on demand is, I will show you right now. In the first step, users, especially pupils, will register easily on our website. They choose their topic in which they need help right now. In the second step, our system will look for a tutor that is free right now and can offer support. And as soon as both agree to the match, they reach a virtual session with an audio and video chat and a virtual board where they can work on exercises and help the pupil in an effective, target-oriented way. Naclario this way offers easy and fast access to tutors. It is accessible for everyone and, of course, we examine our tutors in order for our pupils to have a space, safe space. We started in the last school year and have reached more than 5,000 users by now. One of our tutors, Sabine, says that it's great that you can help this easily. This is fun for us. Our tutors are motivated to volunteer their time. Stefan, for example, pupil, had problems during Corona and he is hoping that this will go on forever. We made it possible through social media like TikTok to reach our target group of pupils and we've had two, more than 2.5 million views, for example, on TikTok. How will we go on? Until the end of the year, we want to reach 50,000 users in order to actually 
actually help more pupils. At the same time, we want to pilot a school version in order to have digital learning support in a school context. This month, we started a cooperation with the University of Munich in order to train our tutors in a pedagogical and didactical way for them to be effective in their training. I hope you like the project. Thank you for your attention. Wow, respect for this huge success, Mirko. Uh, and there's another short movie we are going uh, to uh, see. And you can tell us what it is. Yeah, true. So the second project I brought you is uh, Digital Sparks. Digital Sparks is one of the winners from our category uh, Interdisciplinary Project Ideas for the Hybrid School. And the idea behind Digital Spark is actually to enable pupils to work on topics with the highest societal relevance, um, digitally and across classes. Um, what pupils learn thereby is to be self-organized and self-determined in their learning experience. Okay, so here we go. Let's start. One in two children Outside, the world is on fire and I have to learn about things that are relevant for me right now. I want to talk about climate crisis, about gender identities, about basic income and social justice. I want to work on topics that move me and that concern my own life. Due to COVID-19, the world is upside down, so we can rethink everything, even class. But if we linked topics we care about, out with topics in school. I came up with an idea. Digital Sparks. Digital Sparks are one week online workshops on different topics. I can choose the spark I want to work on. Experts provide relevant information for us online. I picked the topic gender identity. In my group there are 12 other pupils from different cities that care most for this topic too. We ask ourselves questions like what kind of gender identities are there? We discuss and do research. We conduct interviews and listen to expert opinions. And then we dig even deeper. I myself can decide what else I want to learn about. In biospecialization, we study the biological side of things. In political science, I look at the legal framework. At the end of the workshop, we collect and record our thoughts and results and share them through a zine or podcast. But how does the digital spark come about? Pupils suggest topics, experts can submit proposals on the topics, and a jury of pupils choose the concept that will become a digital spark. All digital sparks will be made available on a platform for everyone, open source and for free. So we can finally work on topics that we are interested in, that are important and relevant now. Care to join us? Mirko Schödel, a successful output, thank you so far. And we want to go on here uh, at the stage with uh, Florian Rampelt. Uh, Florian is the, the organizer of Semester Hack, a hackathon that primarily focuses on higher education. Florian, uh, Semester Hack was also a very successful story uh, that wasn't predictable either, was it? No, it, it wasn't really, because it was also spontaneous. I mean, just as Mirko said before, we were like confronted with a certain situation of COVID-19, of lockdowns, of closed uh, schools, but also closed higher education institutions. And as Oliver said before, um, some, some universities just approached us and said, hey, what can we do? We actually wanted to do offline events. We do hackathons, and we did that before with like 30 pupils in a room coming together like here and hacking. And we didn't know how it would work out. We didn't do it before. And uh, we, were, we were just thinking, OK, um, we need to take responsibility and take action. Yeah. And um, it was really, really impressive how just after Easter, like week after week, more and more people joined and more and more universities joined. Because all of them said, the summer semester is coming, and we have no idea what to do. So let's come together, let's use such a format, and let's invent something to make it better. And when was the time or the moment when you have realized, oh, this is going to be big? 
two days before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we only started organizing it two weeks before. Yeah. Uh, I cancelled three weeks before I cancelled my holidays and we said, okay, we need to make something possible. Uh, yeah, two days before, I think two days before we had like 800 participants and then we, it became 1,000 participants and we had a lot of great challenges. So it's really, and I think that is one thing about hackathons also, you need to keep motivated, you need to be motivated, although sometimes it's a step-by-step -step process and only at the hackathon itself you actually see, okay, does it work? And Do people interact? And this, uh, we were talking about this earlier, like feedback culture, so how do you get the people motivated? Uh, it's really important, like for me, first of all, I thought I'm going to be a moderator, interact with them, like I give you advice. And in the end, I ended up in three project teams myself. I think you, keep, <laughs> you, you, you get people motivated by example. You know, it's so, it's so much about collaboration. It's so much about sharing ideas, finding inspiration. For me, the best part of it was all the great people. 1,000 people who I met, like a few hundred of those I had an exchange with mm. who inspired me. Their ideas, but also the people. Um, and we have to lead by example. Yeah, and that was also very, very international, right? I, it was like um, the German Academic Exchange Service was a partner, so we had people from India, people from New York joining us. Our, our colleagues from New York actually took over the night shift, yeah. so, so it's really good that you find some sleep also. Um, but it was not as international as this time. It was much more focused on the German higher education system, and now it's like it was so impressive for me. Like We have people from Palestine, we have people from Uruguay all around the world that we didn't have last time. But it was, to a certain extent, international. And and to underline it, you also brought some footage. Yes, I mean, we had, we had also more than 70 ideas that were submitted as projects at the end. But today we want to show you three of the best, okay. three really inspiring ideas. And they sent us some videos beforehand. So let's take a closer look. <laughs> COVID-19 has a great impact on all our lives. Different aspects of everyday life change from easy to difficult, from closeness to distance, from structure to confusion. This also applies to university studies. A successful study has many important factors, such as a completely new environment or the exchange and familiarization with other fellow students. These do not only influence each other's academic success, but also form long-lasting friendships. Especially first-year students have difficult access to all this in times of COVID-19 and digital teaching. As far as the eye can see, only an empty university without students can be found. And if there are no students, there's little chance for exchange. We think the students must not be left alone with these problems before they begin such an important new phase of life. In the last few months, we focused on solving the students' problems of missing social inclusion and networking. And our solution for this is called UniMatchUp. The main functions of UniMatchUp are oriented towards the basic needs in a university context. Matching with other students can therefore take place in a private chat, a public forum or a joint learning group. The help seeking function enables students to find a helper for an academic problem. Therefore, the students choose their helpers from a list of suitable fellow students. To support their selection, we provide relevant cognitive, behavioral and emotional group awareness information. Alternatively, there's a possibility to discuss questions and answers with all fellow students in public lecture-specific forums. The influence of different users offers a chance for a jointly created and sustainable knowledge base. The search for learning groups is supported by querying relevant factors like their expected grades weighted by the students themselves. Additionally, the search is optimized to recommend other students with complementary knowledge so that mutual support can take place across the network. Besides, we want to support matching beyond university topics. For this purpose, the possibility to add friends to their private network as well as a special forum to get to know each other are implemented. By combining the various functions, students will be able to find suitable fellow students for social exchange, which can be continued within but also outside the application.
graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology from the Leuphana University in Germany. And writing a thesis such as this one can be difficult at the best of times. But during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, I was faced with exceptionally difficult challenges. And this is maybe best captured by the following sentence. Initially, the current study was devised as a laboratory experiment that would comprise of two participants negotiating three rounds in an eight-issue negotiation. However, due to the escalation of the current COVID-19 pandemic, we had to design an online scenario study instead. And now I ask myself, and I ask you the same question, how many other current research studies include similar sentences? Well, it doesn't matter where you are at the moment, where your research field is, and it also doesn't matter how experienced you are as a researcher. For research to go on during those times we have now, it is very important that research goes online. And that's why our team met virtually at the semester hack in 2020 in order to exactly tackle that challenge. We want to make sure that research goes on despite of the coronavirus pandemic. And in order to do so, we think it is very important for research to go online. Our solution, a quick survey among other participants in the hackathon revealed similar challenges. We knew we were not alone in facing challenges with switching our approach from offline to online research. We started after 36 hours of fun and productive to come up with Survey Square, a community for online research. The idea was born that researchers and aspiring researchers need resources and guidance regarding online research tools as well as the opportunity to gain insight from jointly discussing and sharing their online research and online research tool expertise. Our idea also included a prototype for a research tool selection wizard. Or else do you otherwise find the right research tool for your specific needs among the large and ever-growing numbers of tools out there? Looking back, it all seems very simple, but don't be fooled. 36 hours or 2,160 minutes are shorter than they seem. They can of course also be very productive. As a team, we jointly developed our idea into a concept and implemented a first working prototype, our wizard. Each team member brought his or her unique research perspective, skills and expertise to the table to make this happen. Luckily, our journey did not end after 36 hours, so what have we been up to? Based on our surprising second place at this year's hackathon, we were able to transform Service Grid into OnResto.com. OnResto what? OnResto.com is a research project based at Lefana University and funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research fostering online research tool competence. In that project, we are trying to provide open learning and teaching materials for researchers and students alike so they can become more proficient in conducting online research. We are pretty sure that our journey does not end here, so stay tuned. Hey there, I'm Tobias from Corona School, and I'm going to present you our winning project of the Semester Hackathon. We developed a program for digital skills designed for students and teachers' education. During the nationwide school closures, the corona crisis has shown that many pupils couldn't get the support they needed due to the limited knowledge of teachers using digital devices and tools. The underlying problem is fundamental since digital skills play only a minor role in teachers' education. In Germany, only seven out of 60 universities offer mandatory courses for students in this field. Just as important as the theoretical foundations is hands-on experience to test skills in digital classroom settings. Furthermore, the situation is compounded by the fact that universities work on solutions independently and in only a few cases cooperate. Therefore, we've developed the module Digital Lehren Lernen, which is a central but flexible approach to tackle all of the aforementioned problems. In a massive online open course, students can learn fundamental principles, methods, and tools in order to become a digital teaching expert. The course can be attended at any time from anywhere and is guided by the standards of the European framework. After completing the online course, students can now get hands-on experience with digital tools and methods. For this purpose, we use the platform of Corona School to involve students in the community of over 12,000 pupils from all over Germany. With our central approach, students can exchange ideas with others, 
get inspiration in peer-to-peer -peer calls, and reflect their lessons with the individual mentors during the entire time. As of now, this isn't just an idea or a concept. We've already started to cooperate with 11 universities in Germany and launched a pilot phase with about 50 students. Some of the students have already finished the program and we will receive outstanding feedback. We are proud that our project is supported by the Federal Ministry for Education and Science in Germany. Let's pull in our project together and educate students for the School of Tomorrow. Approach the Corona School if you're interested in this project and thank you for tuning in. Well, really impressive projects. Uh, we are talking about the potential of hackathons and, uh, well, here they are. Uh, Florian, uh, to be honest, I don't know, I cannot believe that this is in the result of, a, of an hackathon. So is this the outcome of, of, of work, uh, which, uh, I don't know, 24 hour work? Yeah, I don't think they stopped after two days. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really about, I mean, a hackathon is an inspiring momentum. And it's so great to share all of this inspiration and to focus within the two days on first ideas. But what is crucial and what they showed us in these videos is that you continue to work afterwards. What I love most about the hackathon that we have at the moment is that we have a lot of teams who have been with us already in May. And they're coming back now and they're saying, hey, we learned a lot in the last six months and we want to continue to develop what we're working on, what we are innovating. Because innovation is not a one-day project. It takes time and it is necessary also to take this time in order to develop the future of education. So magic word uh, is implementation, yeah? This, <laughs> For okay. sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so far, Florian. And now we want to talk to Ulrike Haferstroh. Ulrike, you are a leader of the diversity project Unique Together. What is it exactly about and how, do you, how you uh, are connecting with hackathons? Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. First of all, I'm not a leader. <laughs> I'm one of the 12 co-founders. That's uh, very sorry. important because we are a really uh, non-hierarchical uh, organization. And the fun fact is that currently uh, we are part of the Semester Hack. So thank you for this, Florian. And we were founded during the Wir für Schule Hackathon. And uh, we are not one of the winner projects, unfortunately, but we uh, did the work. So what is Gemeinsam Einzigartig about? Um, we are a non-profit organization, uh, a small team of 12 at the moment, and we aim to bring diversity to schools. So what we um, are working on is a platform to connect diverse role models from all aspects of diversity like uh, gender, race, uh, disability um, with teachers so that they can um, come to school to, uh, to your classroom offline or during these times uh, even through a video call. And uh, we even tested it with uh, calls uh, between uh, a gender expert and uh, a school in uh, Japan. And yeah, it, it was really fun to do this during the hackathon. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, but uh, we were just talking about Im implementation. So if you, uh, you maybe sometimes you need a long breath to go on with the work. Do you, do you need uh, um, a certain support? I've, uh, I, uh, I think uh, you know what I mean. Yes, I do. I do. I think all of us in our team, we, we do know what you're talking about. Um, Actually, I really like the explanations um, about the hackathon, what hackathon means, that it's a, a marathon and a hack. Actually, it felt like, more like a sprint. These, uh, w this week, these five days, it really felt like a sprint, and now we're switching to the marathon. Um, we are all volunteers, uh, what means that we are working for free. Um, we're working next to our full-time jobs or studies. And uh, yeah, it takes time and a lot of communication to work on this. Uh, we are still really progressing nicely. Uh, we have our test um, uh, projects and uh, we're working through a, de a complete design sprint at the moment. So we're really working on the platform itself. And um, yeah, it's a lot of work, but we are, we are still doing it and I really want to do it and want to progress and we're all convinced that this is a really good project to 
keep going. Yeah, this is such an important uh, project. Like, uh, if it is uh, when it is about uh, inclusion, so tell us about the, the reactions from people who, who you are talking to. Like, uh, how do they um, respond to it, and uh, what are the the, rea the reactions? Uh, really positive. Uh, we conducted a lot of interviews uh, already uh, during the hackathon just to, to get to know more about the need of teachers and, and, and schools and um, also um, Sozialarbeiter, the social employees in schools, but also about the experts. So what do they need? And we spoke with um, pupils, students in schools and what they missed during their school time. So uh, it, there were so many aspects that they missed and um, Just last week I had a call with a teacher who works in Brandenburg mm. and uh, he told me that uh, they, they have a, a special problem and that for him it's really difficult to get an expert in his class at the moment. Mm. I mean, they cannot invite someone. So they re he was really interested uh, if we can set up a project for him, just a two hours uh, call with an expert who was really uh, experienced with talking uh, with a seventh or eighth grader. So uh, yeah. To, they need it. To be honest, um, politicians, especially in, in, in Germany, they address like inclusion like uh, on the top of the agenda. But if you ask like teachers uh, or students, uh, uh, they say, no, uh, I cannot see it. So what's your experience? No, actually not. Um, the teachers we talked to, they're really interested in it. And uh, I mean, there's a no, lot I, I'm Sorry, so that was a misunderstanding. Uh, I thought uh, the, the teachers were complaining about that, that, that they need more support, you know, that was... Yeah, and I think this is, this is the potential of hackathons too. Yeah. So that we can really bring up ideas and really show uh, ways how it could be possible to change something and, and how easy it could be. And uh, a lot faster than uh, a politician that, who would change uh, any law or something like that. So uh, mm. it, it can be really, really easy and fast. Um, But on the other hand, I think that might be our biggest obstacle yeah. uh, implementing the idea. So is it really possible to, to that the, the, the headmaster of the school says, okay, yes, you're allowed now. Uh, it's enough proof that you do a good, uh, good job and, and uh, these people should be uh, switched into a classroom and, and, and give the presentation on, on race or whatever. Yes, uh, hurdles, obstacles, we will deepen it in a few minutes. want to talk now to Professor Thomas Gegenhuber from the University of Leuphana in Lüneburg. Um, uh, Thomas, you do research on hackathons. What measures can be taken in the uh, aftermath of a hackathon to help implement ideas, what we were talking about? Yeah, and, and, and I think it's really, and, and thank you for the prior comments, because I think it's, it's so important to understand that The hackathon is the sprint, and then there's the marathon. And the marathon, it's 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 sweaty, it's hard work because innovation coming up with new things is is almost easy. But the hard part, especially in the education system that's highly regulated, where you have different jurisdictions and, and responsibilities, uh, such as in Germany, uh, uh, among the different provinces, it's it's just a really hard thing to get the implementation going. And there are things you can do or that we can do uh, to make it better that this idea of civil society and uh, government working together to, to improve uh, solutions. What, what we can do is, for one thing, bottom up strategies. Do we find local change agents that are willing to work with such initiatives? So local school, and you can try out, for example, the project uh, uh, just mentioned before. Another thing is also going from the top down. Although the federal government has no control about the provinces, how they deal with the education system. And, I, and, and Mirko and I, we had a conversation uh, one or two weeks ago. What Wir für Schule did was amazing is they brought together, together with the federal government, all ministers, uh, education ministers from the various provinces. And there the initiatives of Wir für Schule had the ability to pitch to Uh, those uh, are responsible for their various education systems. And 
And here's the thing, politicians are always surprised how professional civil society <laughs> initiatives can be. Yeah. So there is a truly innovative potential. At the same time, we need to change um, so citizen teams that are interdisciplinary, that come from various backgrounds, can create innovative ideas. What they lack a bit is developing ideas takes time. So what, what's happening in six months? What's happening in a year? And here, a traditional company that's providing a boring, lame service that kind of works is an advantage because, you know, as a government, it's always going to be there. It's not working the way we want it, but it kind of works. So we, we prefer to work with the company. Okay. What we need to find a way is how we can, these seeds of innovation, these all these teams that have this amazing energy, how can we find a way that they are legitimate in the eyes of the government and see, okay, we can do a long-term support for these teams and we want to work with these teams. We need to give them a chance. Maybe it sounds a little bit like uh, like authorities or maybe politics is underestimated uh, these uh, uh, the potential of, of uh, hackathons. Um, so how could you or how uh, can uh, can you convince uh, local local authorities uh, to change their mind i mean that is the big question but i i think where we're going is first of all we're going to have success stories yeah uh, from schule uh, from wir versus virus that was mentioned before in in one of your early com conversations and we see that those successes those projects who go the sweaty hard you know do the marathon and, and and we have those stories i think it's it's important that these kind of approach problem solving generating new ideas is going to get more legitimate i think that's one part how we can change the landscape and the other thing is do can we give local schools more control like how you like can we change the way how we think about innovation in the school system? Can we change the laws and the structures and the rules they need to follow? Like if I'm a local school principal and every for everything I need to ask the higher levels, it's difficult to try out something new. new. And at the same time, uh, we also need to find a way, like if, if these hackathons are, that we engage in the conversation with the politicians, like Wiefer Schule did, and say, these are the ideas that we, we, we do. This is regularly show them we can do this maybe even better than any commercial provider. Thomas, I want to bring uh, Margot back in the round. Uh, Margot, um, you heard uh, the statements uh, of uh, our panelists before. What do you think about the challenges? Um, I mean, I'm very impressed first by all those videos, and it's great to really make it as concrete as it gets. Um, and to, to, to the point of, uh, of Thomas, I think this decentralization is very important because I don't think internet solution is a one suits all model. And so giving local tools for people who face in concrete terms problems uh, is sometimes the best way to find solutions because they know better as in they experience a problem. So if you facilitate the prototype phase, but also then the deployment locally, you have way more chances to succeed than if you just apply something coming from the top in people like from people who've never been to the schools. Okay. And uh, y you were, uh, I saw, uh, I saw you shaking with your head uh, a few, few seconds ago. Uh, maybe you can uh, share your thoughts with us. Florian. <laughs> I actually don't remember on what I was shaking my okay. head. <laughs> um, but, 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 I, but I believe um, that, um, like, I, I agree with everything my colleague said before, but um, the, the greatest challenge that, that we are facing um, also with the higher education system is, um, is not only the localization, but also the overall ecosystem that it's embedded in. Mm. And I believe uh, that's something we probably are going to discuss later also is um, it can only be a success what you do. Also, the marathon can only be a success if the hackathon is part of a greater, bigger innovation ecosystem of a mindset um, that is not only focusing on hackathons because it's just one of the ways to collaborate. And I believe there is still a long, a long way to go, despite all this localization that was, that was just mentioned before. Yeah, but if you uh, say this, uh, you have to say, if you, if, you, if you say A, so you have to say B. So w w what is needed then? Political will 
for sure, I think Germany is not as innovative as it wants to be. I really like the new Digital Education Action Plan of the European Commission. I think we can learn from it. I think we can develop our own agendas. It's difficult in Germany, as those joining us from Germany know, because it's a federal system. Um, connected to that funding, I mean, we need to be honest, mm -hmm. that's the elephant in the room. Many of the projects that get applause do not continue to work because they don't have the funding they need. Um, so it is important to have implementation programs also running that first of all give funding, but secondly of all also give support and help those that Thomas talked about who don't know how to work on a sustainable basis and offer the training and the coaching, um, which is really important. Is there, a ki I don't know, but uh, do uh, um, people invest in hackathons? Yes. Uh, there are, great, there are great, great websites out there that I can show to you where there are a lot of hackathons um, that are also with, you know, with commercial partners or with also with ministries to say, we have an implementation program. We versus virus, this huge German hackathon also had an implementation program. Um, so there is private, private companies, but there's also ministries um, who invest in hackathons and invest in the outcomes because, of course, it's an ideation sprint. We heard that a lot and we can all benefit from new ideas. Thomas, I, Thomas, I, it's your turn. Yeah, may I jump in? Because I think it really great fits to, uh, to the prior point and I want to build on that. If we go into the private sector and you think about startups as they grow, you know they're going to start maybe with crowdfunding, getting financing from family and friends, then they might get a grant, then maybe they might go to a VC, and as they grow and develop, you have an ecosystem that supports them. For the hackathons, we don't have such an ecosystem yet. There, what we started now also with We versus Virus, what has been started there is we do a hackathon and then we have an implementation program where also We for Bildung was supported and it lasts about six months. But the question is what happens after six months? If we really know that scaling and creating impact takes a year, maybe two, maybe three, we need to tailor the ecosystem around that so we have something working for the private sector, but also a support ecosystem for social innovation tailored for solutions maybe who want to build something for education, but maybe also for other areas such as the environment. Yeah, referring to this, uh, maybe I ask now uh, also Ulrike and Mirko, maybe Ulrike first. Well, I think, uh, especially in the educational sector, I mean, it would even take even longer to um, establish there. So um, it's not only the funding, it's also the, the, yeah, the restrictions that are set. And mm. uh, Thomas explained it earlier. This is really important. I mean, we really want to change something. We're here to create a world we want to live in. We, we, we want to educate our, our children in. I mean, I have three kids and um, this is what it is about for me. And uh, of course, um, I need to see the, I need to have the feeling that this makes sense and that this can grow and can become real and uh, a bit of help uh, and and to reduce the restrictions would be really really good. Mirko? Well, I think it all comes down to what Florian already said like in one of the first sentences to that we actually need a change of mindset. We actually need a culture in Germany to appreciate innovation and not only to say, okay, this is one hackathon and it's great, we made great PR for it. Um, now we're out from the ministries and political actors, but to say, okay, this is, these are solutions that we actually want to have in schools. These are solutions that we want to support and that we want to bring because they're an advantage to what we have right now. Um, that also means that hackathons, if we want to have like continuous um, progress, that we need uh, long-term support from uh, political actors like uh, the Federal uh, Ministry of Education, from the Kultusminister Conference, uh, from different actors who have the power to actually do something. And uh, it's always great, but uh, if we don't get the support, then we need to find another way and then maybe uh, implement a system where we can just bring uh, bring solutions to the schools because we work with them like closely on a on an individual level. 
Of course, there are existing some highlighted projects supported by politics, but to ask a provo uh, provocative uh, question, maybe uh, the situation is like this because not everybody is addressed uh, when you talk about hackathons. You know what I mean? Like my kids, I am a father of three, they're all digital natives. But when I see my aunt, she is 65 and she's not so familiar with hackathons maybe, uh, and uh, politics is always thinking of the whole society. So what do you say now? Well, so um, I think that's something that you can actually develop in hackathons. So uh, what we made in Good. one of the projects made in Wilferschule is to actually find a solution to bring all people together to make sure that every person in Germany uh, is unable to have a laptop, for example. So there are also like pupils with or families with three kids and there's only one laptop, how are they going to get, engage? Mm. Um, and that we need also development for older people to actually know what digitization is about and how we can use it. Um, that it's not the enemy, but it's like opportunities that we can use. Thomas? Yeah, and I want to add to that. I think the argument that we need to bring there is obviously we're lagging behind in, in digitalization in the entire education sector. And let's invite citizens, let's work together to fix this problem. And of course, hackathon is a word that not everyone understands, but the idea of, hey, let's work together to create solution and seek to implement them, rather than waiting and, and making citizens as part of this change to a story is, I think, something that is uh, communicatable uh, to, to broader audiences. Florian? I would actually choose a little different narrative. I wouldn't start with the solutions, but with the challenges. I think it is very important to have clear messages about the challenges that people are facing where they are. In our higher education system, for example, um, we saw the Match Up app. You know, it's a matching app for students. Mm. 90% of university teachers wouldn't understand what this is about. It's yeah. okay. Mm. But in our hackathon, we also had university teachers from the age of 30 to the age of 60 who worked together on digital teaching mm. because they are very specific challenges. How do I make my seminar digital now? And this is as simple as that. You have a challenge and a hackathon is one of different opportunities to work on that challenge. And I think what we really have to work on, have to, also we have to become better is, is clear messages that do not too much use like all the buzzwords in the digital field and, you know, but being clear about the needs and the challenges of the individual. And also your aunt or whoever has a challenge. Maybe not an educational one, but maybe one that is referred to social contact to others. Mm. Um, and, and I believe everyone has something that can be um, sorted out in a nice, inspiring hackathon. Uh, Margot, you are an expert for uh, online uh, collaboration. So uh, do you see also like maybe uh, people of the older generation there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think with the um, home office, a lot of people had to be dragged in front of the screen more than they wished they could. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think it's something that we experienced to, with the whole spectrum of comforts. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm actually going to hack this question because I, I kind of want to react also and I'm, I will take the private hat, like private startup uh, hat, because we do talk a lot about um, about public money, we do talk a lot about subventions, like subsidies uh, at the end of hackathons. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that one of the best ways to start, like to test a concept uh, whether it's online or not, is to also so validate that the, the product that we've built during the hackathon actually is finding users, is finding clients, um, and it's where like they can be like th those like private and public partnership can make a lot of sense in accelerating this, like this collaboration and making sure that we don't only depend on public money because that's going to be incredibly slow. And there's a lot of initiatives now going in this sense. I mean, I'm more focusing normally on adult education. And I can see, for example, models like 42, which is a school that was started in Paris and now opening two schools, one in Heilbronn and one in Wolfsburg, is taking, for example, applications now. And it's going to be fully free for students who have no obligation to work with any companies. 
And it's also a validation that there is innovation that's possible, even though it's not publicly funded. So I don't think we should always wait for public funding, but I think it's also about creating our own luck mm -hmm. and making sure that we have this yeah, first clients, first uh, users, and that it also creates this ecosystem that we were talking about. Yeah. And it doesn't need to, I mean, I'm not saying that everything should be private. On the opposite, I think it has to be a mix of like, you know, money and that it's easier to test things maybe with the private sector and then to have public funding if we think that it should be going like on another scale of maybe accessing population that couldn't necessarily afford it. That's why it also needs to be quite inclusive, of course. Uh, but I wouldn't throw a rock at the private sector by all means because it also explains why sometimes Germany is a bit behind in terms of uh, digitalization in education. Oh, interesting fact. Uh, do you agree? Partially. Um, I'd say um, when we talk about also the unique potential of European educational systems, I think they should also, compared to other regions of this world, be very much about education as a public good. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we are facing, and many of the topics that we see in our hackathons, are about overcoming monopolies in the educational market mm. that is governed by big private companies. I believe, and I have worked in a startup as well, that we built up with a combination of private and public funding. I believe the combination and private public partnerships for sure, for sure are key. But I also believe that, especially in Europe, we do need a strong open educational initiative created and strengthened through hackathons because I believe education as a public good is one of the strongest aspects of what we have in Europe. So, yeah, and I believe innovation is also possible. I just created an AI learning platform with public money. I think you just have to dare to start something and you need to have the mindset also with public funding and then it works out. Interesting. Any enhancing comments here to this on that? Please, feel free, Mirko. Yeah, well, so I think that's actually what I wanted to say is that uh, public sector is just sometimes too slow and that we uh, cannot mm -hmm. wait to actually have money in like a year or something to do it. So maybe sometimes we just need to start uh, and then need to see how we can actually arrange all the circumstances. Okay, always about the money. It's always, <laughs> always about the money. Feel, uh, maybe a question to Ul Ul Ulrike. Uh, who can or who should learn from hackathons? Everyone. <laughs> yeah, but how? But how then? Because it, it uh, um, in my eyes, in my opinion, two less people know about hackathons, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And then I was also thinking about the, our um, diversity in age uh, in our group, in our team. And uh, to be honest, most of us are younger. Um, I think I'm together with two others, the, the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it would be important. And I, I really like the idea of opening it up to more people and, and, and uh, coming from the challenges. I really like the idea that uh, Florian mentioned. And I think it's important for everyone uh, to, to know about uh, hackathons because it's not only about hacking projects, it's about empowering people to, to dare to change things and, and really to yeah, in, envision something that could be better. Right, Thomas. Yeah, I just want to say something about what I think important is. Um, we also need to be aware hackathon is one format among many other. The key notion is it's about openness. We make an open call for solving problems. People with different backgrounds come together and then within the 48 time uh, uh, they, they create solutions. But we could also do, let's say, a large scale innovation contest and say, okay, we have six months uh, we have phase one and then phase two, and uh, at the end, the winner, it's, we're going to make an innovation contest, and at the end, the winner gets 150k. So I'm just saying there are various modes of how we can bring people together and how can we open up as a government to full such col uh, collaborations. Hackathon is one instrument. We can do a traditional open innovation contest, but we could also do just accelerator programs where we just more focus on people, bringing people together. So there's various kind of ways how we can organize these things. 
And especially what we're going to see in one or two years, we have now projects coming out of the hackathons. And then the question is, in one year, how can they re-enter the hackathon with a new problem so they can recruit new people? So how can we use the hackathons or other formats to help existing initiatives to even further, uh, grow further? I think that's also a challenge that we have, not just to have a lot of wanted, wanted hackathons, but also how can we create accumulation and, 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 and build on each other as these events uh, or kind of these stories kind of grow. Normally, in my eyes, uh, economy must be deeply interested in hackathons, really more than now. So, and I ask myself, why isn't it? I think they are already. If I talk to the companies that... No, I mean like really the big, big companies. They are. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. They, okay. they, they are interested. For us, it's sometimes even more the question, um, if we want to be independent in the hackathons that we organize, um, can we take money, for example? Okay, so this is another um, question yeah. there. So, so, so I really love the exchange we have with many companies, with many stakeholders, American as well as uh, German big tech companies who are very much pushing for hackathon formats, who are very much supporting and organizing all their own hackathons. I mean, probably today we are doing the Digi Edu Hack. There are thousands of other hackathons only in Europe, many of them supported by companies, and which is a good thing, for sure. I would like to talk about one really important question that you asked before, so we are jumping a little, but the question you asked is, who could and should learn from hackathons? Yeah. And uh, Margot started, started um, answering to that. I think what is really crucial and has, hasn't been clear enough here is, very often we talk about user-driven um, innovation when we talk about hackathons. Very often we talk about students but we need to also talk about the stakeholders coming together. It's even more crucial, I think, in the higher education sphere where we work, but also in schools. It's people coming together on eye level and working on a challenge on eye level, the student with the teacher. So it's the individuals, but also the teams who have a unique opportunity to collaborate and to learn from each other through such a format during a hackathon event. And I think that is really crucial. I just wanted to emphasize that. So is this, thank you very much, uh, is this more uh, maybe also a question uh, for education ministries all over Europe? To implement this in school? Thomas? I mean, innovation is always, if you want to infuse something into the social fabric, you need to deal with all relevant stakeholders. And I think uh, also to Marco, I think it's a combination of being able to experiment locally, but also have centralized top-down efforts that help with scaling up good solutions. And along the way, knowing who are the critical stakeholders for realizing the idea, but also who are critical stakeholders in an ecosystem that help creating a support structure that the seeds of innovation and the ideas that we really want to see can flourish and grow. Uh, another question in my eyes also, how uh, can you lower the barrier to make it possible that everybody can uh, be part of a hackathon or get into action with hackathons? Looking at the Whoever, <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> ladies first, sorry. Oh, Margot, yeah. please. Yeah, I mean, I think what's, what's like the real question is not everyone like because it's obviously a question of efficiency in which team, but it's also enough representative for each stakeholder group, because um, these hackathons can very can act as very fast validation loops on an idea, if you have the relevant stakeholders in the same room. For example, if you have you know a concept for a classroom, you will need to have uh, teachers, but you will also need to have potentially students, potentially parents, potentially principal, potentially people who would sustain it like the program afterwards. Um, so having enough of these people who can give also feedback and make the, the service or the product evolve can be extremely powerful. And then when it comes to bringing it to the attention to a lot of people, I think it's each stakeholder group who should also share the word because as we mentioned, there is now a lot of different events. There is a lot of Zoom fatigue. Uh, there is a lot of saturation. And I think we're far away from having fun just joining friends over dinner on Zoom and that people also want to have this concrete 
team spirit and yet have contribution from wherever they can through internet. Very good. Thank you, Margot. Florian? I think what we learned with the Digi EduHack, it's about reducing complexity also. Mm. So we have on platforms um, that I, we have a two-click principle. You need two clicks to get to the end of what you're looking forward. So it needs to be easy to register for a hackathon. That lowers barriers for sure. You need easy messages. That lowers barriers for sure. And you need inspiring examples that people can relate to. Um, and if we combine that, I think it really could work out. Yeah, but well. when you talk about uh, you have to c uh, make messages more clear, so what do you mean by that? Maybe you can give us an example. An example is um, you want to improve your digital teaching, join us in the hackathon. And not having like a huge challenge that describes in the typical okay. academic <laughs> <laughs> flavor that we use um, what uh, new digital teaching and learning scenarios you can develop based on tools and so on and so forth. Simple, clear. Because people are sophisticated enough in order to then um, think about ide ideas afterwards. Um, for us also, for example, we reduced our, our challenges. Like we had a broader range of challenges in the first semester hack and reduced them by half because we said, hey, that's already a lot, you know, to select an idea out of, out of nine challenges now. Um, it's really about reducing complexity. We tend to think, oh yeah, we do a hackathon, let's write down everything that we could work on. Mm. And that is too much, that is overwhelming, that doesn't help us to focus. And that's, that's a homework that I also am still taking with me for the next hackathon that we're organizing. Um, we talked about this earlier this day. Um, the pandemic situation we are facing right now was a massive boost for hackathons. Uh, just to name Wir für Schule, Mirko, uh, just imagine there was no uh, pandemic situation. Uh, could you imagine success like this? And um, how will you go on? Um, I think it's so there's there's two things to say about so the one thing definitely the COVID situation is not good and uh, yeah we nobody wants it um, but now that we have it we actually have to seize uh, the situation and to make the best out of it and it definitely helped us not saying that it should be there uh, against that but um, it definitely helped us and I think it's a catalyzer for, for innovation, definitely. Um, what we actually are planning to do on now is to use the power that we experienced in the first hackathon to do another hackathon the next year, to um, engage more people, to use the potential that's there in the society to um, create even better solutions, to uh, find out what are the needs of the people, uh, where can we adapt, where we can we uh, actually progress in what we have in our system already. Um, let's connect to all the participants who are right now really uh, working on their challenges and maybe you can give them some good advices and tips, Mirko, because you became successful already. Um, so the, the most important thing is to actually um, do what you really want to do and um, really try to do something that's important that you want to give a message to the people and um, yeah, work, work on, the, on the need, keep it as simple as possible, but also um, find solutions and find people that want to support you. So I beg also the other panelists to address a message to all our participants worldwide who are working on their challenges. Maybe you first, Thomas. Yeah, and, and adding to that, like we talked about legitimacy. So are you taken seriously? So work early on, really think about how can I test and prototype my solution? And who's my partner for that? Who do I need to talk with? On your website, uh, place the logo of the hack or maybe you get some regional media partner. Uh, often local media reports proudly about successes of people who won at hackathons. And you can use that to say, hey, these are people who uh, uh, approve me. Uh, and, and, and I would that affect you to think about how can you create legitimacy for your own initiative by tying yourself to success or to media stories or to endorsements uh, from people who are experts from the field. 
Ulrike, maybe you can share your experience uh, with uh, the folks out there. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I really wish you have fun. Have fun, enjoy <laughs> it, because it's really a fun situation, and then just have fun. And uh, remember, it's not a marathon alone. You're together with a team, so really um, enjoy your team, work together, and uh, yeah, have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, Margot, please. I was muted. Typical Zoom situation. Yeah! Uh, <laughs> it's a running gag today, sorry. <laughs> um, I think my main takeaway or suggestion for the participants would be to not consider what they built as a final version, but just as a first iteration. Um, don't fall in love with what you've built. You can do better, especially if you sleep more and if you have more feedback and you integrate it over time. Oh, very so, important. So that's only the start. And also reach out and say what you need. You know, there's Twitter, there is also this community of uh, like in the steering group, like just say what you need and we will support. Don't fall in love with what you built. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Margot. Uh, Florian, you can uh, maybe, ha you ha got additional information now. Yeah, just coming from the online community where we are doing our hackathon at the moment, I, I would see it even more basic. It's ask questions, talk to each other. And there are always ups and downs, you know? Stay motivated. Motivate each other, go out, get some fresh air, find some sleep. Margot just said that. But I think it's really important that you find a team and that you work with others and that you dare to dream together. Oh, this is very good. Uh, Thomas, because I forgot to ask you this, uh, politicians, they rely, of course, always on numbers and uh, researches, and so you do researches on hackathons, so should there be more? Yes, I think it's it's an important instrument, and I think we're gonna, like, if we think about how many crisis hackathons there have been around the globe uh, for the COVID crisis, I think it was 80 or 90. Uh, and educational hackathons, we also see uh, a greater number. So I, I, I do encourage, and I like that this community come together, the people come together, a movement saying, we want to be part of changing the way how we think education or to change the way how we deal with the crisis. And I think this momentum, I, I want to encourage and see more. Um, what I also want to see more is also thinking, what's, what's our long game? Uh, because as we know, like we cannot start only several sprints. We also need to be in the marathon. And, and I think it ties back what you said before, how we can turn into this momentum into a, a societal driving, changing force that helps us build around the world institutional frameworks that social bottom-up innovation from the citizens to, in collaboration with the government can flourish. Oh, that was uh, very good. Thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, I don't know, but, but I'm polite. Uh, did I uh, for, uh, get any questions? Because we were talking about the potential of hackathons. Maybe uh, there was missing one question. And you could ask the question right now. Uh, probably there are quite a lot of questions missing, but there are also answers out there. And <laughs> most of the answers we shouldn't give here, but people should actually join a hackathon now, get out of the live stream as soon as we are finished, and just experience it themselves, because and I believe that's the way to go. Yeah, and please. One thing I want to add that is, is from, and there's research from the participants' per perspective. What, what can you, what hap the experience of a hackathon is, you, it's enjoyment. It's also stressful because it's the, the short time, yeah. but it's enjoyment. Uh, it's networking. You meet other people and you never know how this connection you forge in a hackathon going to shape your life. So networking is a part. It's learning through hackathon. You get uh, exposed to new tools, technologies, new viewpoints. Also that part, the learning part is a big part of the, of the hackathon experience. And lastly, which is of course difficult, but it's, it's a cool if you achieve it. And it's also part of this learning journey is actually with your solution, you are able to make a difference uh, in, in, in a small area of, of, of social life. And, and we need that in our world that, that more people come together. Hey, how can I make a difference uh, uh, to face and, and address a problem or a need we have today. I have now a really intimate question 
uh, question to all of you. Do your loved ones, your partners, your children, do they exactly know what you are doing when I talk about hackathons? Do your wife, do your husband know what you are doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Margot, was it you with the yeah? No, it was Ulrike, right? Yes, yes, it was me. But yes, they do know. They, they do know about it. I mean, um, my husband and I were both working in the digital, digital industry, so uh, yes, he knows. Uh, he thinks I'm a bit crazy, but uh, he tolerates it. And my kids uh, join sometimes in Zoom conference, so I really had to put them away now. <laughs> <laughs> They like it. Uh, actually, also, they, they like the people uh, that they are getting in our home at the moment uh, through, these, th through this work and the hackathons. Yeah, yes. the, the, the surrounding is, the personal surrounding is so important. That's why uh, I, I asked this question. Margot, how is it with you? I mean, I was working remote first before COVID, so I never really suffered from that, uh. Uh, very luckily. Um, but it's also because we're in the very luxurious situation to not have any kids without um, a school system. So I think you do have peace at home and headspace to focus on work. Um, and all the projects that I've been doing were always collaborating with people everywhere in Europe. Uh, and my, my husband is also along those lines. So I'm okay. part of the lucky one who a bit of quiet and who saved on commute times. <laughs> Very good. Mirko, you, I think uh, the last six months were incredible for you because you were putting so much work on uh, a hackathon, Wir für Schule. Um, so what, uh, what is your um, answer to my question? Also, um, I actually quit my previous job to do <laughs> Wir für Schule and to work on this mission to change the educational sector to uh, yeah, engage people. So I think the first moment was what exactly are you doing and why are you doing this and why did you quit your job? Yeah. Um, so I think at the moment right now, my family, my girlfriend, they do understand what I'm doing, but uh, I think the first months were uh, yeah, a, a bit of communication, let's say. <laughs> yeah, I can. In, in, in German, you say uh, Überzeugungsstart, so it's a question uh, of attitude and you have to be really very, very convinced uh, about that, what you're doing, right? Mm. Yes, for, for sure you have to. I think um, for me that answer is also quite interesting because my girlfriend knows what I'm doing yeah. because she also works in the same field, but I'm a triplet. I have a triplet sister who is a teacher and oh. a triplet sister who is an engineer. Oh. Two very different fields that need both innovation a lot. Yeah, right. And they are always, we are very close, they are always my reference points when I talk to them via video calls or on the phone. Like me trying to explain them what I do, for example, here today on a hackathon. And I tell you, it's difficult. It's difficult. They do get my passion. <laughs> they do get that it's something, you know, unusual maybe, that it's something that wants to be innovative. Um, but they don't fully understand it. And that's one of the other homeworks, you know. <laughs> I think if you look after 2020, we have tried out a lot and we have succeeded a lot. But in order for it to be sustainable, I would like to talk to you in a year and tell you, yeah, both my sisters do understand. <laughs> yeah. And they're here at the hackathon. <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was really quite inspiring talking to you. I'm sorry for answering. Uh, uh, have also um, uh, these, these very intimate uh, and personal questions to you but it was yeah it was very very interesting thank you so much for being with us thank you Margot thank you Mirko thank you Ulrike and thank you Thomas all the best for you and uh, yeah uh, stay like this thank you very much and also thank you of course Florian thank you